Good morning, everyone. To our audience here at the United States Institute of Peace and to our audience online uh, in Africa, and especially to our audience in Nigeria. We're extremely pleased to welcome all of you this morning to this online discussion, this webcast discussion with 12 governors from northern Nigeria. These governors have been here uh, in Washington, D.C. for a three-day conference at the United States Institute for Peace discussing the social, economic, and security challenges of northern Nigeria. This group has been led by the distinguished and honorable governor of Bornu State and the chairman, the current chairman of the Northern Nigeria Governors Forum. This morning he and uh, his 10 colleagues will participate uh, in a online discussion on Nigeria beyond Boko Haram. This uh, discussion follows two days of very intense conversations with senior officials at the United States, in the United States government, and with scholars and researchers and experts at the United States Institute of Peace and uh, from NGOs and activist groups here in Washington. For those of you who are online, uh, I would say that the governors have been extraordinarily busy and engaged. Uh, yesterday, uh, they had an opportunity to have a private meeting with Secretary of State John Kerry at the State Department. They met at the White House for 50 minutes with Ambassador Susan Rice, uh, President Obama's senior foreign policy advisor and the director of the National Security Council staff. They also had an hour-long meeting with Gail Smith, who is the USAID administrator uh, and the senior Obama administration uh, expert and leader on development assistance programs. These are just some of the many activities that they have been engaged in and discussions they have held. This morning, uh, we are very privileged to be able to have this discussion uh, uh, on Nigeria beyond Boko Haram, looking at some of the economic and social uh, reconstruction and redevelopment uh, challenges uh, that the governors face. This discussion here at USIP this morning will be led by two well-known uh, and uh, distinguished journalists uh, who are currently uh, working uh, at The Voice uh, of America. For many of our listeners in Africa, they will know them uh, because they listen to them and see them uh, on TV uh, every day. Our two moderators are Alihu Mustafa and Miriama Diallo, both extraordinarily capable and well-known. And they will lead this discussion uh, today. Uh, this is the beginning of our third day uh, of programming. Uh, and beyond today's uh, morning activities here, uh, they will be discussing uh, with a number of American businesses investment and development opportunities, as well uh, as talking uh, about a number of social and economic uh, issues. But I'm going to turn this webcast and online discussion over to uh, uh, Aliyu and Miriama to lead. But I would say to our audience, listen in and send any questions that you have to uh, Facebook and Twitter. Our hashtag is hashtag AskNGGovs. And I'll repeat that, hashtag Ask 
N G goes. Uh, I will now turn this over to Aliou uh, Mustafa and Miriama Diallo to begin the discussion uh, with the 12 governors who are with us at USIP today. Thank you, Ambassador Carson. Uh, we're very appreciative of the opportunity given to us to be part of this discussion. And uh, we welcome everybody around the world to what is going to be a conversation this afternoon. We're not going to have the kind of debate you saw last night, just, just to make that clear. Uh, but we're going to have about 90 minutes of uh, conversation. We're going to be taking a lot of questions uh, from people watching and listening to us. Uh, I would like to, first of all, introduce again my colleague, Mariama uh, Giallo Crandall, uh, who is a very prominent TV personality at the Voice of America from Senegal. I'm from Nigeria, sitting next to my own governor from Sokoto State. And um, I want to say that uh, when we receive questions, everybody is uh, among the governors, of course, is free to uh, give us their thoughts on the question or on the topic that is being asked. Uh, we would like to limit our responses as much as possible to about two minutes so all the governors may have the opportunity to contribute to the discussion that we're going to have. I would also like to urge the governors to please turn on the mic uh, when you speak uh, so people can hear what you, you have to say. So without um, further ado, uh, I will turn to Mariam for to ask for the, the first question that we have received uh, from some of our listeners. Mariam? Thank you, Aliu. And uh, very quickly, uh, just echoing uh, uh, Ambassador Carson and Aliu, and welcome you to Washington. Uh, I'm sure you've uh, seen how exciting, it's an exciting time to be here as we also, uh, as the United States gets ready uh, to elect um, their next uh, president. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and go right on. Uh, we're getting uh, questions from Twitter and from Facebook, and uh, the first question uh, comes uh, from uh, Anas Aminu uh, Korau, and uh, the question is, uh, what will the governors do about the issue of the hungry in IDP camps and the diversion of the food and other relief uh, materials meant for them? So I'm going to turn to uh, maybe Governor Shatima or whoever else wants to take over, but your, your call on this one. Thank you so much. It's undeniable that we have very huge challenges over the issue of the IDPs. We have 153,612 IDPs within the camps in my degree for now. And we have 258,821 IDPs in the satellite camps spread across the nooks and crannies of the state. We, I don't have the number for the IDPs in Adamawa, Taraba, in Niger Republic, in Cameroon, in Chad, and in other parts of Nigeria. We are making efforts in partnership with the international community towards addressing the food security needs of the IDPs. Airports are in the pipeline. Yes, some foods donated by the federal government meet their way on their way to Maiduguri. But I believe this is an issue that was raised on the floor of the Senate, and efforts are being made to retrieve back those stolen uh, commodities. But let me make it very clear that this fixation on the IDP comes in as much as we have needs in the IDP comes. We have 1,446,812 people living within the host community in Maiduguri alone. I think the number of the IDPs living within the host community far outnumber those living in the officially recognized camps at a ratio of about four to one. So let's pay attention, because even in the best of times, our people were the poorest of the poor. 
and now Boko Haram has passed up operaism. So believe me, those living in, within the host community are not finding life easier. In fact, to be quite blunt with you, those in the IDP camps are the BIPs amongst the IDPs. Because at least they are getting attention, medical attention, issues of schooling, and issues of feeding. But the most important thing for me is the leader of the state with the highest number of IDPs in the country is to look beyond life in the IDP camp. Let's find ways of restoring the dignity of our people. IDP camps, historically speaking, the biggest IDP camp in the world is the Dadaab refugee camp in northern Kenya that had a population of 300,000 people. The Kenyan government had to finally summon the political willpower to close out that camp. Mm -hmm. In the same vein, our camps that are existing in Maiduguri and other locations are pregnant with lots of challenges of drug abuse, of early child marriages, <coughs> of prostitution rings, of gangsterism. We have so many challenges, and as long as we allow those institutions to be entrenched, we shall we shall all be prepared for a harvest of negativities in the coming months and years. Yes, so my yes, target yes. is to really see to the return of the people to their homes. Well, uh, um, are there any plans, actually, because there's talk about um, closing them in 2017? And uh, Certainly, you know, we, Hope springs eternal from the hearts of men. Mm -hmm. And most importantly, we know the tremendous efforts exerted by the federal government towards <coughs> bringing the madness in the Northeast to an end. So in communities where there is peace and tranquility, we see no reason why we should stop the people from going back to their villages. Yes, we appreciate and respect the Kampala Convention. But I know my people better than anybody here. We are a poor but very proud people. And we want to restore back their dignity. Thank you. But Eric. somebody cannot sit down in Washington or in London or anywhere and ram down our throat that the people should not be allowed to go back to their homes. It's, it's we have a follow-up question related to that. I don't know if any of the governors is, um, but, but let me ask this question from Fatima. Uh, she sent a question about uh, the same IDP issue asking, what are your plans, meaning you, the governors, for IDPs or people in the IDPs who are not willing to return to their communities after the closure of that uh, of those IDPs? Um, since most, uh, a lot of the governors here actually do maintain those IDPs, I was wondering if uh, anybody has some thoughts on that. Um, should I go to the governor of Bochy State, Barista and Ahmed? Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, uh, we have uh, uh, quite a number of IDPs. Uh, actually, uh, the IDP phenomenon in Bochi State started much earlier than Boko Haram. Uh, it started uh, as a result of internecine conflicts in the North Central and, and parts of Bochi State itself, uh, to the extent that today, when one travels from Jaws to Bochi, you'll come across at least five well-established villages that are villages that have been established by IDPs. And that's um, the spirit with which uh, uh, Bochi State handles uh, the, the, the IDPs. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, I, I, I had a story. When, when, when I was uh, uh, distributing seeds and uh, farm inputs uh, in the 2000, during the 2015 rainy season to IDPs, the leader of the IDPs in Bochi State came out clearly in public and told everybody that even when peace returns to their place, they are not going back. Because whatever they are looking for, they are getting. For example, they have been given land to farm. And uh, at, at the time he was making the statement, I was distributing seeds and, 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 and inputs free of charge to them. So this is our plan for uh, those IDPs that uh, are not going to go back home. We will take them in as we have taken them in. In Bochi State today, uh, there, uh, we, you, you can't find a single camp, IDP camp, 
But that is not because we don't have them and we don't harbor them. But we have taken them in, in the spirit of, uh, uh, the, the African spirit of being your brother's keepers. So, and that is uh, the way we are going. Well, thank you. I just want to remind everyone, uh, if you've just tuned in, we are live uh, at the U.S. Institute of Peace, uh, right here in the heart of uh, Washington, D.C., with governors uh, from Nigeria. Uh, we're talking about paths uh, toward peace and progress. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us online. And, of course, you can continue to send us uh, questions um, at uh, we're live on Facebook. Uh, just enter the keywords uh, U.S. Institute of Peace. Or um, you can also send us uh, questions on Twitter. Just use the hashtag ask um, ask n g gov so g o v s uh, let's move on we have a question uh, from uh, uh, facebook and this one um, says it's from uh, n where samuel akoliza he says um, what will be done uh, to promote a family and community reconciliation i trust the humanitarian organizations and ngos but what plans do the governors have have. Anybody want to take on that one? I think this question is um, related to the um, nature of Nigeria, and I think this uh, gentleman who is asking this question is seeking some clarification on what we are doing to promote cohesion. Anybody? And we know you are doing a lot. Yes, we can. Um, they're saying that what will be done to promote a family and community reconciliation? He says that he trusts the humanitarian organizations and the NGOs, but what are the plans? What uh, are governors doing about that? Uh, thank you so much. With regards to family and community reconciliation, the beauty about the as sad as it is, the tragedy that had befallen the North is, is that it succeeded in further reuniting our people <coughs> instead of dividing them. Boko Haram doesn't discriminate between a Muslim and a Christian. Boko Haram doesn't discriminate between a Kanuri, a Polani, and a non Kanuri or a non Polani. These are lunatics hell bent on a suicidal path and they kill and maim anyone they find along the way. But most importantly, for the leadership, we are making efforts to win the hearts and minds of all our people, but we are paying special attention to our Christian brethren. For instance, just last week, we released 100 million naira for the reconstruction of churches destroyed in Askira Uba and Chibok local government areas. We have not released funds for the construction of mosques. Mosques and churches were equally destroyed. But it's all about winning the hearts and minds of the people and Borno, which is the epicenter of the whole crisis. Yes, we had some conflicts in Goza, born out of the Boko Haram crisis between the Muslims and the Christians. But of the 300 million compensation we paid in Goza, nearly 200 million went to for the rebuilding of churches that were destroyed by the Boko Haram. So we are making efforts, we are reaching out to Khan to establish trust and confidence. And ours is different from the Rwandan tragedy in some ways, because there is no stigmatization of families per se for partaking in that criminality, in that bloodshed. Yes, family members from all our societies were involved. So it's something that we have to really work as a community, as a family, as a team. Okay. And locally, even for the people that are residing in Bauchi, in Taraba, because of age, all ties of fraternity and friendship, they are very much welcome. The governor of Taraba State is of Borno ancestry. He's from the Kwararapa Kingdom. They migrated from the Lake Chad region down to to their present abode, which can be attested to by Professor Padin. So many of his kinsmen are along the shores of the Lake Chad as fishermen. So quite a number of our people have resettled in, okay. in Taraba. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency. Um, I'd like to ask the governors on my right here this question. This is about security. Um, I realize that maybe if we don't pick on them, they might just decide not to 
say anything. <laughs> um, I'm going to go to the uh, governor of Kuala State, um, Governor uh, Abdul Fattah Ahmed. Um, Your Excellency, this question is from Benga Isaac Ani. He said, many people mistrust security uh, operations or operators due to past abuses. What are the governors doing to address that? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, the issue of security is something that has to be pursued from an inclusive perspective. If truly you want the confidence to be built in between the populace and the government and of course the security agencies. And this we have sought to carry out by enhancing the interface between the public and the people and the security agencies. Firstly, we have, for instance, um, in Quara, what we have is a robust security council and, of course, a robust security committee. This allows for stakeholders at different levels to be involved, and it gives us the opportunity of getting the first-hand information on clear security challenges in specific areas, and solutions are made available in such a way and manner that the people are carried on in the process of securing themselves. So in other words, there's a lot more promotion of community policing now, which gives everybody the confidence that security agencies' resources are channeled towards ensuring peaceful coexistence. And this has translated into a major conflict resolution process and a major uh, peaceful coexistence among the people. It's a continuous thing because the communities are growing. New people People are coming in daily with new challenges, so we keep looking at how to explore these ways and um, upscale how we reach out to the people. So by and large, um, the inclusiveness of the process has allowed a lot more confidence to be built in the security apparatus and, of course, in deployment of uh, services. Thank you, thank you, Your Excellency. I want to do a quick follow-up on this. I know a lot of uh, governors have been demanding for state police in the past. I'm not sure that all of them want the same thing, but since we're talking about the police and past abuses that some people are referring to, I would like to, any of the governors here to address that particular issue for the need for state police, because some people have expressed the fear that if governors are allowed to control the police, some of them might misuse those police forces. Ah, okay. Uh, can we? Okay, and then we'll come back to you. All right. Um, uh, who wants to address it? Sure, you can go ahead. Okay, uh, that's the governor of Taraba State, uh, Mr. Darius Ishak. Darius uh, Dixon Ishak, governor of Taraba State. I would like to address the issue of uh, police state police because uh, my state happened to be in opposition and we are not finding it easy uh, in la uh, for the police to take orders from us most of the commissioners feel they should take orders from the center and that makes the running of the state very very difficult particularly for me that i came into the state and the state was in chaos uh, completely the system and peace has run down. And I've managed within one year, five months, to bring back the peace. But intermittently, you'll find when I need the police most, they are not there. And so that makes the running of the state difficult. It's just an issue of saying you are given the crown, but you have no power on the, of the crown. And uh, I think we copied our constitution from the U.S. from here. And uh, we deleted some of the important aspects of it. And that is here, I'm seeing state police all over the place, even local government police and the federal police. I wonder why in Nigeria we won't have that. And that is very critical for someone who is an uh, opposition. I don't think it's fair to have a governor who doesn't control the instrument of the power. That has been really hampering my peace progress. I would have done it faster if the police is totally in my control. Well, agreed. Here and there, you talk of abuses. But I think the, the benefits outweigh the abuses that will come. And by and large, I think our society is getting more and more enlightened, that you'll find that the abuses are being reduced in any case. And so I think that there is a need for the states to have police. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank you, and I think Governor Ahmed, you wanted to uh, say something on that as well? Yes, I was just trying to add a little bit that um, 
as a writer to what my colleague from Taraba State has said, no doubt you see Nigeria is growing in size. Uh, today we have close to 180 to 200 million Nigerians, and truly it's becoming a bit more difficult for the current policing system to take care of the critical needs of securing people's lives. And um, you will see that the way the system is, um, so society is formed at different layers, communities, local governments, districts, uh, you know, geographical distribution, it is becoming clearer that we require different layers of policing to be able to get people to live very peacefully. Um, if you look at it in the past, for instance, in the 60s, we had different layers of policing, and it worked efficiently. Um, it all got wiped out because of the change in government in 1966, 67. So I think it is very critical that we look at the other layers of policing, creating strict responsibilities for them and allow them to take that role. As it is today, it is already formed in a quasi level. Almost every community you go to, you'll see vigilantes, you'll see other security levels formed by different groups. So in getting to create a local policing system will only require us to formalize these structures into well properly structured laws and give them responsibilities so that they can carry out security support system. So no doubt the need for layers of police uh, below the federal police is critical to support the growing uh, size of the population. Thank you, Thank you very much. much. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you, Governor Ahmed. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, another question. I think I'm pretty sure maybe it came from Twitter. Oh, would you like to say something? Absolutely. No, 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 no. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Sorry, I'm also coming very. I'm coming a little bit late. It's totally fine. And okay. just introduce yourself very quickly so people know who you are. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. much. Thank I just want to contribute to that on the issue of state. By police. the way, that's the governor of Plateau State. Yes. Long. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, as a speaker and in, in the parliament that time, we were all arguing against it, uh, against the state police. But today, I've seen a different dimension, and so I'm arguing for state police. Why? I look at it on two dimensions. One, in respect to funding and also the knowledge of the environment. Because I see a policeman as somebody who must also understand the environment, understand the people, understand what he is doing in terms of uh, his intelligence. So sometimes in Nigeria, what the difficulty we have is, for instance, posting a policeman from another state far away southeast to come to Plateau who doesn't understand the environment, he doesn't know the environment, he doesn't know the terrain, to say he's doing work of, of, of policing. So what we usually do now is to engage civilians. You saw what happened in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, the, in the Northeast. The, 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 the civilian uh, JTF were very effective because they knew they, they, they understand the environment. To the extent now the army is beginning to absorb them or the police is beginning to absorb them. So why not turn them into state police? Just just put them, uh, upgrade them into into the into the state police. So I see knowledge of the environment as very important and terrain. And secondly, when you talk of funding. In our, in our constitution, it is very clear. They say uh, the governors are chief security officers. But in the real sense, we are not chief security officers. Thank because you. you can't give order to a commissioner, commissioner of police. The only funding I see is the salaries that are paid to policemen. But the entire structure of funding and everything in the state is being done by the state government. Okay. So that will give us the reason for state police, okay. so that we control this, or let us also control the state we, police. We, we have a lot of questions that are coming, but it appears uh, like this state police issue is a very interesting one for the governors. Uh, why don't we deal with some of the questions first, and then maybe if we need to, we can come back. Because I saw the governor of Sokoto State, who was a former speaker of the House of Representatives shaking his head when something was mentioned about a discussion in the Parliament regarding this issue. You want to take a minute to say a word or two on this? <laughs> well, thank you very much. I, I, I was shaking my head because um, while presiding over the House of Representatives of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, uh, where you have uh, a, a macrocosm of, 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 of the Nigerian state, Every, 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 every society, every constituency being represented, the House was almost unanimous on state policy. Because we, we appreciate 
the, the, the volume of challenges associated with the current system of policing that we have in the country. So in the constitutional amendment, we also supported that um, uh, the, 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 the federating states should have uh, uh, state police because we, uh, we believe that um, there is a need for, for that to complement the federal police. Thank you, okay. sir. We'll uh, move on uh, to a few, and I think I'm going to combine, actually, uh, these, question, these two questions. Um, the first one is from Isaac Oni, and he talks about, um, this is his question, youth uh, in minority religions seem to have no place in leadership, uh, potentially leading to future crises. What are the governors doing to address this? And while we're at it, let me just touch on another question that's kind of similar in that same um, Realm. And this one is from uh, Benedict Sibasa. It's from Facebook. Uh, what are the plans uh, uh, for the governors to promote the rights of ethnic minorities in northern Nigeria? So ethnic minorities and also uh, religion, religious minorities. Who wants to take on that? You want to go to the federal magistrate? Yes. Uh, Thank you. Um, so that's uh, I, Governor Sunny Bello yes, from Niger State. Uh, Niger State. Thank you. I think, I think there's a lot of misconception. And um, uh, from the crop of governors we have right now, I believe everyone is dedicated and motivated towards um, uh, inclusiveness in uh, governance. And um, I also want to believe that from what I have seen so far, uh, most of the governors have made efforts to see that they accommodate virtually every uh, ethnic uh, minority within the state. We certainly in Niger State will have done that. Uh, uh, we have a very strong uh, zoning system uh, in our state. It's still very strong. We have three zones, A, B, and C, uh, which uh, zone A is mostly uh, the Nufis, zone B, the Bagis, and uh, the House of Fulani is in zone C. And what we have done, we, we try to accommodate everyone, uh, regardless of your religion, uh, into government. And I think uh, most of the uh, APC uh, governors, and I think most of the governors in the northern states of Nigeria are doing the same thing. So uh, that is my own experience. Uh, I want to uh, confirm that, yes, it's a very sensitive uh, matter, but we're doing our possible best to see that we include everyone in the system of governance. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, I want to go to the Deputy Governor of Kano State, Professor Harvey Sabuboka, for this question, although I know this is a question that all the governors might want to address because it's one of those um, issues that keeps popping up, corruption. And this question comes from Nadira in New York. It says, what initiatives are you are being initiated or implemented to tackle corruption in your state. Uh, Professor Hafiz, do you want to take that on? Well, thank you very much. <clears throat> Let me speak uh, specifically on Kano State, on assumption of office one and, and a half years ago. We revitalized the state public complaints and uh, uh, prosecution co commission, uh, whose mandate by law was apart from the issue of arbitration, the issue of you know uh, challenging uh, corruption issues within the uh, state service, and uh, we appointed a very well-known human rights activist a lawyer as the chair of that commission. And the activities actually since then uh, have been on uh, very, very clear in terms of the uh, vigor with which uh, the commission is pursuing the issue of uh, corruption in, in the state. So much so that the national agencies, the AFCC and ICPC, have found the commission as a worthy partner. They are training them and they are collaborating even in their own uh, national assignment with the state uh, commission and we are making a lot of progress 
uh, in that respect. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you. Um, another reminder that we are uh, live at the U.S. Institute of Peace uh, in Washington, D.C. If you just tuned in, uh, we uh, have the governors uh, uh, from uh, the Nigerian northern state who are visiting Washington um, talking about paths uh, towards peace uh, and progress. Uh, we're very happy to have them here, and I hope you joining us online on Facebook Live. Uh, just enter keywords the U.S. Institute of Peace. We're also on Twitter. Um, just use the hashtag. Uh, ask N G G O V S. I'm just uh, spelling it all out. So hashtag A S K N G G O V S. So two G's. Uh, let's move on to, uh, to more questions. And this time, uh, something that comes uh, from uh, Jason Warner. Uh, it's, he's a professor at the U.S. Uh, Military Academy. And he is asking this question, what are the top misconceptions uh, that American academics and policy uh, uh, works hold about the counterterrorism fight against Boko Haram? Who would like to take on that? Can you repeat the question, please? Uh, the question is, what are the top misconceptions uh, that American academics, so American uh, professors uh, and policy uh, wonks, uh, hold about the counterterrorism fight against Boko Haram? So basically, so basically, what you're doing, um, I'm sure your states are doing a lot of work, and uh, a lot of people like to criticize uh, some of these governors, you're not doing enough. So what are th those misconceptions that you think uh, American uh, uh, people usually have about that? Well, one of the major misconceptions has to do with the nature of the crisis itself. There are these misconceptions that it has very serious linkages with the global terrorist network. It's largely a phenomenon born out of social exclusivity. It's largely locally based and driven by local grievances. Yes, efforts are being made by the terrorists to link up with the global jihadist community, but it's largely a local phenomenon that is capable of metastasizing into a bigger conflagration if no efforts are made to nip in the bud the nascent insurgency. Because if you look at the location of Nigeria and the location of the Northeast, if you leave my degree in the morning, as bad as our roads are, by evening you will reach most of the trouble spots in Africa. Bangui in Central Africa, the Darfur region of Sudan, Juba in Southern Sudan, and you can reach the border with Libya. So there is a need for the Western intelligentsia and the academic community to make greater efforts towards enlightening the Western establishment on the need to pay greater attention to addressing the underlying causes of this insurgency in Northern Nigeria because the whole of the North is a cake of gunpowder waiting to explode. Poverty is endemic in the North. We have become a byword for backwardness, most of the negative indices that is bringing the nation down are from the North. So we need greater attention. It's ironical that Nigeria is not getting even one pip of the attention that is being showed on Afghanistan or on Syria. Yes, we are a medium income nation, but we are largely bifurcated along two lines. The South is relatively much more prosperous than the North. They have better infrastructure, much more educated than the northern parts of the country. But believe me, we are but going what, to what, what, what are you doing about that? Like, you just we, brought we up a very making, good point about we are, the, we, the differences all between of the us, South and the North. Especially the present crop of leaders in northern Nigeria are very determined to change the pace of the North, to change the narrative from negativity to positivity. And we are all passionate about education because it is the greatest game changer. We are all passionate about fighting poverty. And fighting poverty entails investment in agriculture. Because ordinarily, as I have repeatedly said, a Northern Nigerian has no business being poor. 
But the government, whether we like it or not, we are going to play a very prominent role in pushing our people out of poverty, and we owe no apology to anybody. Talking about private sector, the private sector can come in where there is a semblance of peace and tranquility. So we will put our people on the first ladder of Jeffrey Sachs' first ladder of development and will invest in education, as I have said, in job creation through agriculture, in gender empowerment, in girl child education, in health care, especially in strengthening our primary health care centers, in alternative energy sources, because power is the sine qua non for any industrial take up. We don't have the power, but we have the resources. We'll make sure that our hydroelectric power project in Taraba State is completed. The federal government is very much involved. Mm -hmm. We have gas deposits in the Lake Chat, in Bauchi State. We want to harness our in-house potentials with the limited resources available at our disposal to see that we have really redefined the meaning and concept of modern governance. Thank you. Let, let me, I just have to ask a very quick question. Uh, you talk about gender parity, and uh, this is something that I, I notice uh, from seeing all the governors here uh, being all male, uh, the ones that are visiting. So uh, as a woman here, I just want to wanna ask, uh, maybe that's not your fault, but maybe people who are listening in Nigeria, uh, what is being done to push uh, some of these women uh, into leadership positions like yours? Does anybody want to take on that? Abubakar from Bauchi. Uh, I think the way and the place to start is uh, by the efforts uh, we are making in uh, educating the girl child. Uh, we have an endemic problem in that. Uh, we, 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 we have a problem generally uh, with out-of-school children, but particularly with uh, the girl child. And uh, we believe uh, by educating the girl child, uh, many other things will now fall into place. Improved uh, health care, improved uh, participation in, uh, in, 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 in economic activities uh, of, uh, of the uh, female gender. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's a build-up. It, it, it's a, a long-term uh, solution, uh, but uh, I believe most, if not all, of the states of, the, uh, of Nigeria have appreciated this, and uh, we are taking action in that respect. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Follow, let, me, uh, let me follow that up, <laughs> okay. because I'm a victim of it, and I think I will speak better. <laughs> uh, the question, I want to re-emphasize, Dario Sishaku is my name, I'm from Taraba State, and I competed against a woman who feels that the post should be allocated to her. You can see the debate yesterday with Hillary Clinton and uh, Donald Trump. The Americans didn't just pick her as a woman and say, we're allocating you to be a president. No, the woman was competing. She beat the men at the primaries, and she's competing with another male and, and for the presidency. It's not an allocation issue. It starts from education. If the women folk are educated enough, just like Hillary Clinton educated enough to hold responsible positions for 30 years in governance, and she's speaking as somebody responsible enough to be a president and not a businessman, so you will see from there that, yes, the Americans can cast their vote for that woman because she's capable, she's competent. You don't allocate a position as sensitive as senators or as governors or as presidents just for gender. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I, I, I think the I think, women, think, go ahead, me, go ahead. <laughs> I think my, my, my colleague is a bit emotional. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but I think we have, we, have, we have educated women that can, that can hold very high positions. Uh, but personally, I think uh, it has more to do with the culture. And uh, the girl-child education will help. Uh, for me, in most of the states, you would see that uh, we're making efforts to accommodate women, especially in the council, in the executive council, which uh, in my own case, out of um, 14, we have three women. Uh, we have more women special advisors, I believe, and we have a few women director generals, and uh, they will grow into the in the political system. So it has it has to do with the culture, the environment, the northern 
believe that uh, uh, women women should, uh, should should remain within a certain uh, yeah. level. But uh, okay. but uh, but it, all that is changing with the girl child education, and generally, if you improve the level of education within the northern states and uh, we do more awareness campaigns, uh, I think I think it it will help because I've met lots of intelligent women that can can be president in Nigeria. So, uh, and if you look at our secondary schools, I was, uh, coincidentally, I was in university, I went to a convocation last week, and I went to a secondary school graduation uh, ceremony some weeks back. All the prizes went to women. Okay. All. All the prizes went to women. And the number of women outweighs the number of men two to one. And they got all the prizes. They took everything. They didn't leave anything for every man. <laughs> they were so greedy that they won all the prizes. <laughs> <laughs> so greedy, greedy is good sometimes. But I just right. want to okay. address real quick um, uh, the, uh, the governor yeah, well, that okay. I think women, women, women don't, don't, don't expect the, those positions to just be allocated. Um, right. And I think not just in Nigeria. Let's talk about you know African general sub-Saharan Africa. Right. And women have been fighting. And they know they have to fight for these positions. You have okay. the president of Liberia. You have Rwanda with half of the women in, uh, in uh, uh, members of parliament being women. So that's basically, I think it's the culture. Um, how do you get more women to get involved? And, right. and I think that's what we're talking about today. But thank um, you very much. Let's, let's uh, move on to okay, another let's question. Let's have the uh, deputy governor kind of quickly address this. We have other uh, we need to move to. Yeah, thank you very much, Hafiz Abwakar from Kano State. Uh, I, I think the point that we need to appreciate, honestly, is that we are making substantial, we are making substantial progress on this issue. This question, you know, the same question would have been asked in 1960. We are asking the same question today in a situation where we have made substantial progress. Kano, for example, in northern Nigeria, actually is a home of uh, conservatism in terms of these issues. But today, in Kano, as I was saying yesterday, first in our primary school enrollment, we have reached a position of 49% against 51% of girl-child enrollment. Our biggest problem in that case is the issue of retention. I was opportune to chair an implementation committee of setting up the state second university. And in the first year, we had 56% of the admissions you know, being female, and that trend has been maintained up to the third year now. So almost Northwest University is one of the first, we can see, female-dominated university okay. at the heart of northern Nigeria. Thank Today you. in Kano, we have the first female accountant general. In addition to commissioners, my permanent secretary is a woman, both in my office, in the Ministry of Education. We are making substantial progress. We had the chief justice of the whole federation of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, a woman. And so we are making substantial progress. I agree entirely that we need to also prioritize and also invest heavily in the issue of girl-child education, but we must accept, I think, the progress that we have been making. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. you. Been making. Thank Thank you. you. Uh, let's, let's move to other issues. Um, I, I want to go to the governor of Sokoto State because the Sultan of Sokoto and some other religious leaders have recently warned against the current banning of the Shiite groups, uh, which um, is in place in some states like Kaduna, Katsina, Plato and probably Kanu, um, cautioning that such action could give birth to another hardline religious group. So my question to the governor of Sokoto State first, and other governors are welcome to address the issue too, is how do you see the potential for peaceful, cohesive existence between the various Islamic states like the Shia, Zala, Tariqa, and the rest of them? Thank you very much. This is a very important um, issue. But uh, before I take it on, uh, my brother here, the the, the 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 deputy governor of Kano, who is sitting for the governor of Kano, uh, has been shaking his head, and he even came out to say that they have not banned Shiite in Kano. And uh, if I remember correctly, you have mentioned that Kano is one of the states that had banned um, Shiite activities. I'm not sure that the Sultan of Sokoto has taken that position. 
I have just uh, consulted uh, the palace, and um, uh, the response I got is uh, is not is not confirmed that he has actually done that. However, I, it does not say that uh, states like Plato and um, uh, Kaduna have not banned Islamic movement of Nigeria. Uh, if, if, if I am uh, right, I remember seeing uh, online Governor Erifai trying to clarify that uh, he did not ban Shiite activities in, 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 in Kaduna State. What he has banned and prescribed is Islamic movement of Nigeria. Um, whatever it is, I, I believe that uh, there is a need for first and uh, most importantly dialogue. Uh, with all uh, various religious groups in Nigeria, uh, because uh, all of us, even those who don't believe in God, require peace for them to, 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 to live. So we, we must work, all of us, towards creating a very, very peaceful uh, atmosphere, an atmosphere of accommodation, an atmosphere of, of understanding. Uh, it's, it's, it's not about being coercive, but it's about being, being, uh, be, being uh, uh, engaging and, and talking to ourselves. I, I believe that um, as a group, Northern Governors Forum, we are going to meet and discuss this very, very, very vexed issue of Shia. And I recommend strongly that we should come as a body and speak on it uh, with one voice. I, 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 would, I would rather leave it at that at this stage. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anybody else wants to address um, Mr. Lalong, you want to say something? Because I know your state is one of the states that is in question. Yes. Uh, well, I also, on behalf of the of my state, will say that uh, uh, for obvious reasons, uh, what the decision we took at that time, as far as we are concerned, was to save the state. You know, Plateau has been under crisis for a very long time. And when a dimension of that kind, magnitude, comes into Plateau, it will take a different dimension. It will not be a shite uh, against uh, other uh, denominations in Islam. It will be Christian-Muslim fight. Because any destruction that will lead to a destruction of a mosque or a church will take a religious dimension. And so Plateau was just coming out of it, and then there was this influx of shit moving from Bauchi, moving from Kaduna, and all uh, in Plateau State for a procession. So Plateau had no uh, no other option than to bind the shared, uh, the shared procession at that time. We are not saying we are condemning the shit, but we are co condemning any procession by shit in uh, in uh, in Plateau State. And my reason was that if the headquarter in Kaduna was no longer existing, a branch should not exist in my state. There must be a headquarter, a, a institution. That's what I asked them. I said, if, if you don't have a headquarter, you can't form a branch in my state. Go back and resuscitate your headquarter before you come back to a branch. That's the position of Plato State. And as far as I'm, I'm, I'm concerned, and it was also coming towards the time that Plato was hosting the, the trade fair. Right now, trade fair is going on in my state. A trade fair was going to be uh, to take place, and then the procession was going to frustrate investors from coming to my state. So we took that decision, and it helped us. And trade fair is right now going on in my state. Thank you. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you, Governor. I, I have to. Thank you. No, I don't want them to move the headquarters to Plato. Thank you. Th thank you, Governors. I have to tell you, we are getting bombarded by questions, and I wish we had all day um, to get through all of them. But um, uh, it looks like we won't be able to. Uh, so we'll move on to next questions. And I have to also say, I'm glad to see that the energy went completely up when we started talking about women. So I'm very glad about that. Um, just a note. Uh, I, but let's move on to. Uh, I also wanted to contribute about the gender thing. Yes, uh, I was going to ask a question. Okay, excellent. Because we'll I think we have to take that seriously. Sure, sure, yes. go ahead. I, I, we have to take that seriously. Very. I mentioned something about the child as uh, child rights uh, law. What is happening to the child rights law? What uh, what uh, are UNICEF doing about the child rights law? In Plateau State, we, passed, we adopted it in 2004. Implementation, they are not giving a force to it for proper implementation. I don't have a problem of, uh, of girl child, uh, girl child, much problem about girl child in my state. 
Because in my state, we have many secondary schools for girls, and the best secondary schools are all reserved for, 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 for women. So in terms of appointments, you find we're giving them, but not up to 30 percent. We may not be able to make up to 30 percent, okay. but we measure up to that, uh, that stage. So the question I will always say is that if a state like Plato would doubt much problem about girl child is adopting the child rights law, what are other states doing to adopt the Child Rights Act that will also help us in implementation and also educating the girl child? Thank you. Thank you. Sir. That's a great question, and hopefully right. all the governors uh, heard that, and uh, they will be able to contribute to, to that. Um, I'll move on to this one. And speaking of girl child and speaking of education, we know that uh, basically the narrative uh, for Boko Haram is that education is not good for you. Um, what the, just the term even means is that education is a sin. So how the question, this question comes uh, from Alan Hester uh, on Facebook, and he says, what is the primary way that the government or some of those, uh, these governors can counter the narratives of Boko Haram? And this time speaking uh, when it comes to education. Governor Shatima, you want to go on? Because you wanted to say something on the, on the whole women issue as well. Go ahead. No, I, uh, <laughs> In addressing the Boko Haram narrative, we are largely adopting a holistic approach encompassing the economic as well as the political. The first verse revealed to the Prophet Muhammad was Ikra, read. So Islam is not a buzz to education. And the Prophet of Islam said, seek for knowledge even if it is in China. By then, China was perceived to be the farthest place on the end, end of the world. So that goes to show that Islam is not in any way opposed to the pursuit of education, be it Western or Islamic education. The most important thing is, in as much as we are winning in the boys' war, we have to win the hearts and minds of the people by making massive investments in job creation, in education, and finding a space for them in the workstation of the 21st century. That's the best way of countering the Boko Haram narratives in the immediate and in the long term. OK. Thank you, sir. Um, I, I want to go to the Bochi governor for this, because this happens to look like a legal question. I know we have a couple of lawyer governors, including my governor here. But I want to go to uh, Governor Abubakar from Bochi. Um, recently, about 21 Chibo girls were released in Nigeria. Uh, while everybody was happy with that, uh, some people did express some concern that if there was any swap between the federal government and the Boko Haram organization, uh, they were post that about four commanders of the Boko Haram were swapped for the 21 girls. Some people are asking the question, is that a good strategy to follow? Is that uh, something that the government should be doing, swiping uh, Boko Haram elements f for the release of the Chibo girls? I, I, I think um, it's not uh, strictly a legal question. The federal government of Nigeria has not confirmed that uh, there was any swap uh, with respect to the uh, release of uh, the uh, Chibok girls. In fact, uh, the federal government denied the fact that there was any swap. So uh, be that the case, uh, I think uh, and that's the position of the federal government of Nigeria, and um, they are the main actors in this respect. I, I don't think I uh, have anything counter to say in respect of that. Uh, the governor want to address the issue of this. Um, anybody? Otherwise, okay. we can go to the next question. Uh, well, we can move on to another question uh, from Twitter. Um, it's actually, I think it's an organization called uh, Landmines in Africa. And this is a question um, that he, uh, the organization is asking, uh, what is being done to clear the landmines and uh, IEDs left by Boko Haram? Are there any organizations out there that are helping you? So this has to do with landmines. Anybody? Well, with regards to the landmines, 
I think the Nigerian army is making a lot of efforts towards addressing those challenges. But we have a, a brigadier general in the Nigerian army who is in a better position to shed more light. But I believe they are addressing the issue frontally. Um, someone else wants to say something? Brigade. Go ahead. We have a military ahead, officer. Uh, Brigadier, but although the, uh, we had thought we were going to uh, limit this to the governors, but this is a necessity for some military intervention, sure. I guess. Go ahead. So please. I am Brigadier General Sale Bala. I'm a retired officer. Um, recently retired, just five years ago. And um, I work as an advisor to the Minister of Interior. Um, I would just speak from a, a global context. Understanding uh, the operations that my colleagues are up to in the Northeast over the past uh, seven, eight years, so to speak. Um, we get regular and daily reports on the diffusing and the lifting of, of mines which uh, uh, Boko Haram have laid all over Sambisa forest. So there is that massive Nigeria military effort that is going on. But we all know that as in post-conflict uh, peace building, it's also a very, very important, massive international effort uh, to support in the lifting of the mines, but especially with the peculiarity of the mines that are IEDs. Are there any specific organizations out there that are helping you deal with the issue? Not to my knowledge for now, okay. but I know it is basically an indigenous Nigerian military effort in clearing those mines and making the, uh, uh, the mobility corridors safe for the, for, for the withdrawing uh, 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 victims after the liberation of their various uh, locations. That's for so much that I can speak. And uh, I know the, uh, the Nigeria Army uh, engineers are well primed, indeed with a lot of support from the U.S. government. Uh, with, the, with the substantial donation of uh, anti-mine anti, anti vehicles, the MRAPs that we have seen, um, uh, the other alternative to uh, the Leahy Law, where the U.S. is supporting us in non-lethal equipment. So there was, there's been quite some uh, uh, effort towards that. Uh, do you want to take a shot at this other question we asked earlier about the swiping of uh, uh, Boko Haram elements for, for the release of the girls? It's quite above my pay grade. <laughs> okay, let me move on quickly. Um, in the um, in this speech uh, published by Daily Trust uh, that uh, Governor Kashif Shatima wrote, why 10 northern governors are in Washington, he identified poverty as the what he calls the mother of them all in terms of the problems that uh, bring about problems, uh, issues like the Boko Haram. I want to ask a specific question, and please, um, I know you, you all have been dealing with this issue of poverty in all your states, but I need to ask and to hear from anybody, what specific measures are you taking to curb poverty in your states? Anybody can take this question. This is an issue that has been identified for a very long time as the root cause of some of the social ills in Nigeria. Well, I can largely speak on behalf of most of us. Yes, sir. As I said earlier, we are poised to change the pace of northern Nigeria. And all of us are making massive investments in agriculture. Nigeria is a net importer of virtually everything. We are importing 20 million eggs from South Africa every day. We import toothpicks from Canada, cabbages from the United States packaged in Dubai and delivered to Nigeria. So opportunities abound. And we are massively taking advantage of our land resources and our agricultural potential to add value to our society by creating jobs in the agricultural sector. All of us here are very serious about investments in agriculture. And believe me, in the coming months and years, we'll start reaping bountiful harvests from our airports. KB State is adding about 1.4 million tons of rice to our kitty this year. So also are so many other states of the Federation that are actively engaging 
in agricultural production, and it will create a bit of opportunities for our people. Thank you. Uh, does any other governor want to talk about any measure they might be taking locally in their own states? Yes, sir. Well, thank you very much. I, I would like to add my voice to this uh, all-important topic and say that in Sokoto State, outside the efforts being made by the government to subsidize heavily on, on agriculture, we are also having a well-established um, uh, committee, which is a, will soon be a commission for Zakat and Wakaf. Uh, Zakat, of course, we all know is uh, one of the five pillars of Islam uh, for the collation of arms that, are, that, that, that should be well distributed to the to the needy as, as prescribed by, by 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 the Holy Quran and work of, of course is talking about foundation and we are, we are collaborating with the international worker foundations globally for us to get uh, some support for for, for the needy in Sokoto state but by the way we have we have uh, uh, any identified vulnerable person in Sokoto state is placed on a stipend of 7500 naira per month and uh, that 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 has been sustained and it's been ongoing for nearly six years now. And of course, we are doing a lot in terms of um, uh, providing trainings and vocational trainings to our youth, to the vulnerable groups that can, that can, that can, that can participate in, in empowering them. And a lot is being done on, uh, of course, women empowerment, youth empowerment in, in various states in the North. I believe um, uh, not only giving them the, 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 what, what they need for the, their daily uh, subsistence is, is, is necessary, but what is also more important is uh, is giving them the the desired education, the desired uh, skill for them to earn a living by themselves, and that much is receiving uh, good attention from virtually all the states in the north. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Governor. We'll uh, move on, and this is actually a very very simple question from Ugo Moses uh, on Facebook, and um, he's asking the question: Why are only the northern governors invited? That might be a, a, a question <laughs> for USIP, but but. but but I'm going to let you answer. Uh, before you do that, I would also, I think Ambassador Carson uh, addressed this earlier about you uh, being here meeting with um, Secretary Rice, meeting with Secretary Kerry. So we would like to hear, if, if, if for nothing, um, w what has come out of those meetings, for example. So also address why are only the Northern governors invited? Well, there is a greater understanding of the challenges that is confronting the northern part of this country that came out of this meeting. The most important thing is that we are one nation with a common destiny. But let it be borne in mind that if you pick northern Nigeria, you are picks Nigeria. And the challenges confronting the nation are more onerous, more challenging in the north than in the south. And let it be made very clear that this is not the first time we are coming to Washington to discuss challenges facing northern Nigeria. From the USIP, this is the second from, time, right? This is the second time. Yes. The first time was when President Goodluck Ebele Jonathan was at the helm of affairs in Nigeria. It had nothing to do with the fact that a Northerner is at the helm of appears in Nigeria, it has everything to do with the challenges we are facing in Nigeria. Thank you. Um, just want to uh, say something very quickly also. I know we're here asking all the, 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 the tough questions here, uh, just to remind people who are watching and uh, people who have never heard about Nigeria who are just tuning in that um, there are also a lot of good things that are happening in Nigeria. And I think in the past two, three years, uh, we've seen uh, the country elect a new president in, in, in very peaceful elections. We've also seen Nigeria become the largest uh, economy, uh, 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 biggest economy in sub-Saharan Africa. Africa, which was a first, basically taking out, uh, taking the place of South Africa. I guess hopefully they fell out a little bit um, and they will come back again. So there are a lot of positive things that are happening in the country. Uh, and thanks for being here once again for the governors to discuss uh, challenges and that are part of life. And it's always, it cannot be perfect, but um, we're glad that you're working towards uh, that goal. Okay. I'll turn to uh, Ali. Thank you, Mariama. Uh, we have about 10 minutes before we wrap up. But um, there's a question from uh, Jyoti via Twitter, uh, who says, beyond military fighting, what other measures are being put in place to reduce radicalization? Radicalization, which we know is a big problem. Um, 
Anybody? Professor Afis, you want to take that? Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, I think uh, part of uh, the discussions uh, since we came here has been the issue of uh, way forward. And I think there is agreement in terms of prioritization that education comes first. When you say education actually is all encompassing that we need to invest, uh, that will include the issue of infrastructure, it will include the issue of the, the teachers in terms of capacity and development, but more so the other big component, the issue of the curriculum itself. And I think part of the de-radicalization process would be a critical look at the actually curriculum of both formal and informal Islamic education. So it's all part of the issue of investment in that. And then following that one, certainly, is the issue of the job creation component. So in that one, I think uh, we will achieve a lot in addition to other measures. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Excellency. Um, uh, in um, if I may. Yes, please. Yes, uh, uh, Brigadier General Salabala, again, Federal Minister of Interior. I would like to refer us to uh, the uh, soft approach to counterterrorism um, uh, policy, which uh, was enunciated uh, and uh, housed in the Office of the National Security Advisor. And the newly launched uh, uh, Nigeria counterterrorism policy also ad addresses the issues of uh, radicalization and uh, uh, as such. So um, there is a clear structure and there are clear efforts. Uh, in fact, uh, the Nigerian army has uh, an operation in itself called the uh, Operations uh, Safe Corridor, if I'll be, if, 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 I'll, uh, if I'm correct, where they have uh, collected a group of, uh, uh, of surrendered Boko Haram uh, 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 fighters, and they are going through uh, a process supported by, 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 by international partners. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to address my next question to Governor Kashim Shatima, because in, in your speech, um, you did uh, mention the possibility that, the, uh, as we all know, there's going to be an election in this country very soon. And uh, you did express some concern that the outcome of the election, which we do not know as of now, may impact the, your discussion with um, USIP and um, the implementation of some of the goals that you set for yourselves. How prepared are you to deal with whatever the outcome is? Well, I made those remarks jokingly, <laughs> but it is incontestable that nobody can change his geography, nor select your neighbor. And as I earlier said, America has very strong institutions. Whichever way the pendulum swings, we believe the institutions in America will make it possible for us to have a sustained relationship with the United States uh, government. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, so very quickly, uh, since you're in Washington, uh, obviously you've been here, you watched uh, a debate last night. I'm sure you've been uh, following the, the, the campaign uh, very, uh, very closely. We're just curious to know, uh, what, what do you make of, uh, as Africans visiting here, um, does anybody, I mean, not being political, just, just what do you think about it? You, you watch them, uh, what, are, what are your thoughts? Just to follow up on that question. Anyway, you, uh, the worst cause that a Chinese may wish for you is for you to live in interesting times. And you guys are living in very interesting times. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing I can say. <laughs> and we are wishing you meaning. The <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, we wish you um, well. Okay, I, I, I have. Uh, uh, they say we have to wrap up. Okay, uh, we're wrapping up. Okay, okay, um, over there. okay, we're wrapping up right now, meaning we're done. Yes. We're done. No more questions. Uh, anyways, I think there was something about possibility of amnesty, uh, maybe for some of the, the Haram fights, but time. we'll move on. Um, I want to thank everybody. Mariama Diallo from VOA. Um, Thanks for joining us today. And we want to thank uh, especially the governors and, of course, the, the entourage, the officials that came with them uh, for their presence here and their part the participation of the governors. And uh, we are sure that Nigeria and the United States will be the uh, benefactors eventually. Thank you very much, and uh, we appreciate you at night. And the thank conversation you. continues on social media, so yep. join in.